Hello everyone, this is Spencer Snowling from Hydromantis and thank you for attending today's webinar. Today we're going to be talking about the GPSX Statistical Goodness of Fit tool. That's a tool that we added in a couple of releases ago that you can use to evaluate how well your simulation fits a bunch of measured data that you've imported into the into the model and uh, I'll go through how to set that up and what kind of information you can get out of it and as usual I'll run a desktop demonstration. My name is Spencer Snowling, I'm VP of Product Development here at Hydromantis and I'm glad that you could join us. So the plan as is usual uh, for today is that I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, running dynamic simulations and uh, how you use this statistical analysis tool and how it can be useful for you when you're calibrating your uh, models to some dynamic data. I'll show you how to set up the GPSX statistical analysis tools for various kinds of analyses and then uh, I'll run a desktop demonstration. Um, what I'm going to be running today is the demonstration that is available in the sample layouts menu and I'll go through it in detail as we move along. And as always, if you have any questions that come to mind while you're uh, listening to the webinar today, you can open up the questions box in your GoToWebinar dashboard and type in the question. Uh, usually what I'll do is I'll save up all the questions and I'll answer them all at once at the end of the webinar. Okay, so uh, first of all, when you're calibrating your models, if you're doing a dynamic calibration, what you're doing is you're trying to see whether the model will do a good job of matching to the uh, data set that you have provided. And fortunately, GPSX, you know, we've built in um, some tools to allow you to plot simulations and get out the data from the simulation effectively, and also to uh, read the data from your uh, Excel spreadsheets and plot that on the same graph alongside the simulation. So I'm sure for those of you who've been using GPSX for a while, you've probably done this in one way or another where you um, plot a line and you've got a bunch of data points and you hope uh, as much as you can that the data, that the simulation is going to go through those data points in a, in a reasonable fashion. And this is usually, uh, for dynamic simulations, the most uh, straightforward way to calibrate them is to um, plot some effluent quality, for example, or plot some mixed liquor numbers or what have you. This is an effluent COD example here and uh, plot the data on there and it's going to have some scatter to it both from the variability and the dynamics of the of the plant that you're modeling but also some measurement error and other uncertainties that will be uh, sort of wrapped up in that data that you have and we want to be able to make sure that that model is going to try and fit those data points as as much as possible. One thing to keep in mind when you're doing this, by the way, is the frequency of the data points that you have in your output versus the data points that are driving your input. Typically when you're doing a dynamic calibration, uh, you're driving the uh, changes in the influent that are coming into the plant. That would be flow and pH and temperature and all of the different concentrations and so on. And then often you have some output data that looks like this. Uh, this is actually mixed liquor data, sorry. Uh, you'll have some uh, output of some sort that you'll be plotting along by your simulation. And you may not have data at the exact same frequency in both of those cases. Um, what you'll find is that if your input data is at a much less frequent uh, interval, then you may see that it's tough to match uh, your output when you have a lot more data points. And I've run into that problem a few times on various projects that I've uh, worked on. It's pretty tough to, to catch a peak in the output uh, and the effluent from a plant if you don't have very frequent influent data to show the changes in the flow that are, are coming along. So typically what we do is we make adjustments to various parameters. Uh, uh, you know, we adjust the influent characterization and the settling parameters and those sorts of things. And then we, we run simulations over and over again to try and see uh, whether that makes the calibration better or worse. And we try to address some sort of deficiencies um, in the way that the model is doing its prediction. So we move along uh, and then at some point uh, we feel, well, that's, that's pretty much good enough. That's about as good as we're going to be able to get it. And then you stop at that point, uh, just sort of visually inspecting the results uh, and say, well, that, that seems like it's pretty good and we'll stop there. Um, what we wanted to do is, and, and what we frequently were asked is, can you, can you give me some sort of measurement of how good this fit really is? And that's a fairly subjective uh, thing to ask. And so we've put in very, a large number of different options of different ways to evaluate it so that you can find one that works for your particular needs or reflects the, the type of information that you're trying to, to get out of the software. 
But essentially what we're asking is, does that line go through the data points you know, reasonably well? And it's a good thing to have uh, a way to evaluate that numerically because looking at it, just sort of uh, dynamically, uh, you know, looking at the way this thing goes up and down, you know, some points there's uh, places where it overshoots and undershoots. This is not a particularly good fit right along here, even though I would say overall that's actually a very good fit. And if you were just looking at this, would you say that the uh, red line or the blue line was a better fit? Well, we have a way to perform uh, an analysis and go on data point by data point and see how far off those things are and then come up with some sort of overall metric that we can use. Okay, so these are features that we added uh, a few years ago um, in version 6.3. And it allows you to do post-simulation analysis of that goodness of fit to understand how well uh, the simulation matches up to that measured data. Now, it only works for time series uh, only. So you have to be able to do a dynamic simulation where you have run the simulation for some number of days. And of course, obviously, you have to have some data that you're matching to. So as I mentioned, we have lots of different ways to calculate that, and there's lots of statistical uh, output that you can use, and hopefully one of those will uh, sort of be able to uh, describe the fit for you in the way that makes sense to you. So this can be done on any variable where you have some time series data, where you're making a prediction, and all you have to do is make sure that you've got uh, the variable plotted on an XY graph, and you're showing the data that you're fitting to. And it compares those things, it measures the residuals, the differences between the data point and the model at all of the data points. And it automatically calculates a number of different kinds of error measurements. So all of this output that you're going to get from these types of analyses that I'm going to show you here uh, can be plotted and they can be output uh, and graphed and, and, and evaluated for you along. Uh, so when you generate an Excel spreadsheet report that normally shows you all the details of uh, you know, the actual time series data and also the simulation, you can get the statistical analysis out with that as well. So you've set up your model, you're running your simulation, you've imported your data as normal, and then you want to add in the statistical analysis. It's as simple, really, as right-clicking on a graph and then selecting the statistics menu and then selecting the particular parameter uh, that you want to be able to do that for. So you can do this for multiple graphs and multiple parameters. When you do that, you'll come up with this menu here, and it's got three parts to it that are of importance. First of all, it has the actual evaluation of fit calculation that it's going to do. And I'm going to uh, run through some demonstrations of these, but this plot of simulated versus measured is the one that I find to be most useful. Then you have a plot of the residual. So this residual, as we mentioned, is the difference between the data point, the value of the data point, and the value of the simulation at the same point in time. And you can pick different ways to measure those residuals. And also, we can deal with the data in a couple of different ways. Um, first of all, we can deal with that data as if it was a grab sample, as if that was a single data point, or we can actually uh, take uh, parts of that uh, simulation and make a composite sample out of them and then compare that to the data point that you have. So what you're trying to do is sort of match it up with the data that you have, whether that data was a grab or whether the data itself was uh, a composite variable. So once you've got that done, every time you run your simulation, it takes a look at each one of these data points, one after another. It takes a look at what is the value of that simulation at that point in time, and it takes the difference, and it calculates uh, the residual. And you can plot back, actually, the residuals, their absolute values, the square of the residuals, the relative residuals. Those are where we divide it by the magnitude of the value itself, so that tells you a bit about the variance. And uh, we can also do that, as I mentioned, by dealing with the simulation as a single data point in time, as if that data was a grab sample. Or if this data point that you're measuring to is actually a composite, 24-hour composite sample, for example, um, we can treat the modeling simulation results in exactly the same way. So you're comparing a composite data point to uh, the data point that's taken from a composite sample to a simulation that is a simulated composite sample for the same period of time. So we can take the differences there as well. And so you either um, select uh, the grab sample or the two different types of uh, composite variables that we have. They're either composite in time or in flow. And uh, then you select those, and we will do the, comp the computations accordingly. 
So this is an example of one of the types of new outputs that will pop up once you've selected those. And here uh, we're putting up the predicted versus measured. And as I mentioned before, this is one that I use uh, quite frequently to sort of visually assess in a very uh, straightforward way to look at whether my uh, values that are coming out of the model match up and do a good job and are not too biased one way or the other when I do my uh, simulation. So we can see here that for every one of the data points that we have, we plot it uh, measured value on this axis and the predicted value from the simulation on the other axis. And we want, of course, if we have an absolutely perfect uh, simulation where every one of our uh, simulation lines passed exactly through all the data points, they would plot all the way along this line here. And so a perfect 45 degree angle line. Then, of course, that never happens because there's measurement error and there's some assumptions we're making while we use the model. Uh, but uh, this will allow you to see that you're getting a reasonable fit. And, of course, one of the key things to keep in mind is whether it's clustering on one side or the other, tell you whether it's under-predicting or over-predicting the values. You can also get a somewhat similar type of uh, information out of looking at this graph, which is a histogram of the residuals. And here we can see that uh, some of the values are positive and some are negative. And really what we're doing is we're collecting up uh, all of the data points and looking at those residuals and see whether they are normally distributed around the actual simulation value, pardon me, the data value itself. So in other words, it's saying uh, all of those values that I have for the residuals, all those differences, do they fall in some sort of um, normal distribution around, it's not, not in this case a mean, but it's around the zero point, the point at which we actually had no residual at all. So if you're showing a graph that looks somewhat like this, that's saying, well, I'm getting uh, some, on the, the, some that are over-predicting, some that are under-predicting, uh, but most of them are falling, they, you know, they're, they're gathering towards the middle here, towards that zero point, which tells me this is actually a pretty good fit in, 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 in the sense that it's not biased in one way or the other. Now, in addition to all of that, you can choose to output a uh, set of error calculations. And these are the things that we're calculating in the background that help us populate those, uh, those graphs. And in this case, uh, we're going to show you the mean of the residuals and absolute, squared, relative, and all of those. These are all options that you can choose to plot. But in the, mean, in the meantime, even if you don't plot them, you can get them off of uh, this graph as well. And there's a lot of statistical analysis. I won't go into it in today's webinar, but if you look in the GPSX technical reference, you'll find all the details about how we calculate all this information. Okay, well, I always find it's easier to explain what I'm talking about by doing an actual demonstration, so that's what I'm going to do right now. So just to uh, reiterate, by the way, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm looking at, uh, if I go to the sample layouts menu and I go to the software features, statistical evaluation of model fit, that is the layout that I'm actually playing with uh, right now, so you can do that yourself um, and, and experiment with this and take a look at how it works. So just to lay the, the background here, this is a, just a simple conventional plug flow activated sludge tank, and we're plotting effluent, COD, ammonia, TSS, and I also have a graph here for the mixed liquor concentration at the end of the plug flow tank. And we are running uh, a one-day dynamic simulation that's got some uh, diurnal pattern to the flow, and I'm reading in some data here for uh, the influent concentrations that are coming into the plant. So not only does the flow go up and down during the day, but the concentrations of the various components do as well. And you can see these numbers change here as the simulation uh, moves along. Okay, so... This is plotting the effluent concentrations here. We can see this data, uh, the simulation passes through the data points, uh, not too badly. Uh, here's the, uh, the effluent numbers that are coming out. And for this particular example that I've put together, our default uh, run here, the, the fit is fairly poor. Uh, mixed liquor, pardon me, the uh, effluent solids numbers are also somewhat close, but not exactly a great fit. And the mixed liquor is consistently um, under predicting uh, the model's under-predicting what that mixed liquor is. So I've got different types of uh, variations shown here. Some fit better than others, and some of them are under-predicting and over-predicting. So let's take a look here by uh, running that statistical analysis. And if I go here, right-click, go to Statistics, and go to COD, I can now plot the things that I want to see. So let's plot that simulated versus measured, and I'm also going to plot the square of the residuals. I'm going to plot them both versus the value of the residuals themselves, 
and also, pardon me, I'm going to plot the square of the residuals versus the actual measured data point that you have, and also I'm going to plot them versus time. And I'm going to leave this on grab sample uh, as I did before. So when you do that, you'll see some other graphs pop up here. So I'll use the auto arrange button to put those in a way that we can see them nicely. And we can see here that uh, even though this looks like a reasonably good fit for the scale that I was plotting and so on, um, we can take a look here and see uh, in the measured versus predicted graph, uh, predicted versus measured graph, that the many of the data points actually lie uh, above the 45 degree line, meaning that we actually have um, uh, you know, a little bit of a bias towards uh, over-predicting uh, the value. And of course, that is shown here. You can see the fact that that line is actually in the upper half of the data points. It's going over top of many, uh, quite, a, quite a few more of them lie below the line than they do above. We can also uh, plot here the uh, residuals uh, versus the measured, and we can see here that uh, in some ways we're saying that we're, the lower points are the ones that are not being uh, predicted as well as up here in the highs, uh, val higher values of, of COD, the, the uh, residuals are smaller. Um, and, but pretty much it's equally bad from the beginning to the front. There's no particular uh, trend here showing us that we were better in one point in time than another. So let's go ahead and do that for these uh, other ones as well. So let's do these here. And we'll plot that. So now we can see here, of course, that uh, uh, this was very poor uh, fit, for example. We can see that almost all the data points lie below uh, this uh, graph here, meaning that it's underpredicted, as we can see. Uh, it gets worse as we go along in time, right? This is a farther, a larger deviation here as we go farther uh, into the day. And we can see here that it's actually the higher values are the ones that are being underpredicted the most, which makes some sense. Okay, I'll quickly do these other ones here as well. I'll plot those. So that's not too bad. You know, we can see in the predictive versus measured here, it kind of fits uh, not too badly. And let's do it for mixed liquor as well. And this one here is interesting to look at because, of course, it's a really tight fit, a really tight fit of data that's going along, and we and the simulation misses it completely. So we can see down here there's that tight fit of uh, data for sure. It's a very uh, linear type relationship between uh, uh, the measured uh, value and the residual because, of course, the data is almost exactly the same in all cases. So. Uh, pardon me, the simulation is the same. So the data, as the data goes up and down, that pretty much correlates with how much, uh, the, what the value of the residual is. Okay, so that tells us a story. That tells us that we're hitting some of these better than others, and uh, we can now take some actions to try and calibrate this better. So um, there's lots of different ways we could go about doing this, but uh, for the sake of the story that we're telling to demonstrate this here today, I've created a number of scenarios. These are here for you to play around with if you would like to go through them one at a time in the sample layouts menu uh, layout that's available. First step is to uh, dial up that uh, growth rate, because we can see here that, that uh, we were very low, and so we've now made a change to the uh, maximum uh, specific growth rate. Obviously, we're dialing it down because we are showing that the effluent ammonia was too low. There's actually too much nitrification happening. So let's run that again, and so we'll see whether that uh, improves the situation. So went from 0.9 to 0.8, and we can see here that now that's a much better fit. Now, instead of having all the data points down here, we've, we're now passing more, more through the middle, and we can see that we're getting a much better job done than we were compared to the previous uh, steps. And did that change things out here? Probably not very much because we're just changing the autotrophic uh, activity. So uh, it doesn't change uh, COD uh, or the mixed liquor very much. Okay, next step. Let's uh, move on to the things that you would typically do in a calibration, the settling parameters. So let's look at the TSS and see whether we get a bit better uh, uh, example out here. Now that's pushing that up again. Now we're getting a much better uh, fit here. Again, it's not showing any particular uh, time, period of time that's uh, better than any other period of time. And our mixed liquor is still too low. So now it's time for us to, when we want to change mixed liquor concentration when you're calibrating a model, as I'm sure you uh, know that it's the influent characterization that has the largest effect on our mixed liquor concentration. And so uh, let's make one adjustment to our influent characterization in this last uh, step here. We are going to adjust the 
particulate inert fraction of the total COD that's coming into the plant. That's that particulate inert stuff that just goes in and accumulates and becomes part of the uh, mixed liquor but doesn't actually get converted by the biomass. So uh, let's run that one more time. And now we can see here that uh, our mixed liquor is now passing through uh, the middle of that, those sets of data points. And uh, of course, as I was saying, it's very flat data, so it looks a little odd when you plot it on the pr predicted versus uh, measured because our predicted values are pretty much all the same. It's pretty much 3,000 milligrams per liter for the whole day. And so any of that variability that was coming from the measurement uh, error or the measurement uncertainty is giving us this spread from uh, left to right here, but the simulation uh, holds pretty solid at uh, 3,000. So this is a, a very kind of interesting, very quick way to, to add, um, you know, another tool to your uh, arsenal of things to do to allow you to investigate how these things fit together. Um, I find it to be very useful. As I mentioned, I've, I've, I've come to rely on this predicted versus measured graph in order to just confirm when I'm looking at, uh, you know, something like this. Actually, probably a better example is here. When I'm looking at something like that, I, I, it's really good to be able to have this graph to go along with it. I mean, this kind of looks pretty good, but this actually tells me that, uh, you know, that uh, distribution of residuals um, certainly is falling on both sides of the line. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'll pop back to my uh, slides here. <clears throat> Just wind up with a few thoughts, uh, noting that this really is a good tool for demonstrating the quality of a model calibration to somebody else. It's nice to be able to say, here, I've done this calibration. Yeah, there's some scatter in the data. You know, there's always going to be some variability in the data that's not captured by the model. But we can see uh, that even though there is that variability and we're not hitting all the data points, those residuals are nicely distributed on, on, on either side of the simulation value. So that way we know that we're not biasing it one way or the other. It does uh, identify places where you have systematic over or under prediction, and that can actually help you deal with the data that you have uh, in and of itself. Um, as I'm sure if you've dealt with uh, dealing with lots of data to be, to be used for models, you'll know that um, often uh, sorting out the data that you have and understanding whether is, was it measured here or there, does that include this recycle or is it measured after the recycle or before the recycle, those sorts of things are always somewhat challenging. Um, this can, tool can actually help you when you have a systematic uh, deficiency, a systematic uh, inability to match a particular variable, then that might help you to identify maybe that data isn't uh, measured in the way that you think it is, you know, uh, so that can be very helpful as well. Um, certainly it can help to sort of identify places where your data is um, more challenging than others. <clears throat>